This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 164 of the Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. Find them online at biostarus.com. On today's show, we share what to look for in a clinician to ride with. The critter of the show is the Polish chicken. In Critter Nutrition, we focus on vitamin E. In Coffee Clatch, we ask, what breed of dog are you? Listen in. I'm Tigger. And I'm Patty. And Coach Jen is on vacation, so we have Coach Amber. Woohoo! <laughs> Glad to be here. And we're already driving her nuts, so, you know, oh, yeah. just the kind of, she took the kind of circus she was not expecting. But you I know. love it. Anyway, I'm loving every minute. Is she on vacation? That's my question. Is she really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Good point. Yeah. And you just came back from vacation because I saw some pictures on Facebook. I did. I actually went to Virginia, which I used to live in, which was which is where you live. And I, I have to tell you, hands down, it was probably one of the best family vacations we have ever had. We didn't have a minute to spare. We we did you didn't something. Didn't go to every- Colorado. No. Well, we didn't because it's really hard for my oldest to travel with the two grandchildren that far. And last wow. year, it was a great trip, but it was it coming back. It was it was. <laughs> we don't need to relive that anytime soon. So we decided to. And also, my middle daughter had just redone their house, so there was eleven people in the house. Never st- were on top of each other. It was great, but we did something every day. But one of the very fun things that they did for a Mother's Day present, they hired a photographer to do family photos, and it was on top of being the best best vacation that we ever had. Getting to do the photos was just awesome. We've never really done anything like I did that when the kids were young, but it was just it was just awesome, and it was really great because, as you know, Tigger, my youngest son, ended up I had to bring him to college, so it was sort of nice to have that, and that's why we've always done this week, along with it being my husband's birthday. We always do this week because the girls were always going to college, so now Ray is off to college, so. Can you can you believe race in college? No, 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 no. Yeah, no, I can't. So there's that. I'm an empty nester. Peter and I are empty nesters. Can you believe that? That's just a very weird concept to be alone after so many years. But and it, you know, it's not feel? Feel. well. It's weird. It's very weird. Peter and I walked around <laughs> looking at each other, going, "This is strange. This is just very strange." But I am going to tell you. I mean, it's weird. Like we kept, we went into his room and we were standing there and we're looking around. And Peter looked at me, and goes, "You know, I've never been in this room. I've never been in this room <laughs> for this period." Of time. So I thought that was kind of funny. But so it's that part strange. And just Peter and I've been married for thirty three years, and most of it we've had kids at home, one way or the other. But I'm going to tell you some of the major benefits of not having a child at home. One, number one, when I wake up in the morning and I go out to the kitchen, do you know something? It's an amazing thing. You ready for this? It's exactly the way I left it. So it's clean. I have to tell you, I called Ray this morning and I told him, I was like, man, I really do miss you. This has been, this is not going to be the easiest thing in the world, but I'm telling you when I come home from work or when I get up in the morning and my house is clean because it's exactly the way I left it. I just, just, I just, I just want to spin. <laughs> so in a week's time, I'll probably be like, okay, I was kidding. I'd rather clean up stuff, but for right now, I'm pretty happy with that, but it's a weird thing, but it's that tied in with the vacation and it's all been a, a good thing. So the vacation was good. We'll go to Colorado next year. Um, and uh, getting Ray off to school was, you know, it was, it was, it's been a big month. One of the things I think of about spring, summer, and fall, whether you're taking a vacation, it's also a time where a lot of people start taking clinics with yeah. instructor trainers. And um, I thought it was a really good time to 
share our tip what to look for in the right clinician for you. So let's go. So now we're at roundtable, and our topic of discussion is what to look for in a clinician you want to ride with. And I was thinking about this because sometimes you see notices of clinics on Facebook with various trainers and riders. And I know from experience that I have taken clinics with trainers that it really didn't work for me. I spent a lot of money finding that out. (laughs) And I've also clinicked with maybe less famous trainers that I got Mm -hmm. a lot out of. Where do you want to start, Patty? I mean, what would be at the top of your list um, in making a recommendation for, you know, how, how to whittle down what's important for each person with a clinician? Well, when we decided to talk about this, I have two perspectives, one for myself, but also when I'm choosing for my clients, like if I'm going to bring somebody in for my clients, the things that that I feel like are important. But I'm going to start with myself, I think, first. Number one, I think, and probably the most important, well, there's two that kind of go hand in hand, to know that they that whoever we're dealing with, I don't care if they're very famous. The biggest thing to me is that they obviously understand the training scale and how to train. But there's there's positivity and reward for the horses. That is a big deal to me because I find for myself, and then I'm going to segue over into the client's part, because a lot of times clinicians push you through troubles. Because like you go to somebody, you know, when I go and yeah. teach clinics, I always say, oh my gosh, I can't pick up the left lead canner, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, you know, what I'll do is I'll sit back and I'll watch what the person's doing without me interjecting so I can see what they're doing. So I then know how to to see what the reactions are. So I think that observation of that, but also just understanding that they're going to be very positive and reinforce the horses in a way that because you're going to be pushing them outside of their comfort zone that they get rewarded for. Because a lot of times, as we know, Tigger, as we're being pushed, we get sloppy. As we get sloppy, that's a little harder on the horse. So as long as I know that the horse is willing to keep because I'm rewarding it, that's a big thing for me. I like a clinician, first and foremost, that doesn't play to the audience or the auditors, I should say. So that's that's you know, a really good one. Yeah. This is my time in the ring. I don't mind that auditors are there, but focus on me mm-hmm. and my horse and helping us get yeah. better. That's a and very good point. What would be your next tip? I mean, obviously, um, well, so I've got... I, if you go with somebody who's foreign, I think it's very important that you can understand them. So, yeah, because as you know, I'm a very, very positive person when it comes to training and teaching. So for me, it's not that I can't have someone climb all over me. They absolutely can, especially if I need to be pushed. But the other thing is, is that I just know when I try so hard to do what the person is saying, but if I can't understand what they're saying and I keep repeating the same thing over and over again, that falls back into the, it not being positive for the horse, which I then struggle with. So I need to know if it's somebody foreign that I need to understand them. That's a big one for me. For sure. And I find that, and this is in retrospect, this is the the 2020 part how many clinics I probably would have gotten more benefit out of just being an auditor. (laughs) Yeah. And picking up tips and saying, Oh yeah, I do that too. And seeing what the correction is and the exercises. So you can save your wallet a little bit by auditing. And then the next time the clinician comes, then you, then you know what you're going to be riding with. I mean, how many times have you gone and watched somebody or even just watched somebody le- somebody's lesson and heard the clinician say something very similar to what your trainer may be saying, but they may have said it yep. just right at the And you're like, oh, light bulb, got it. And uh-huh. you didn't pay. So that, that, yeah, that's a big one. That's a very big one too. I like that. What other tips do you have? 
I think that, you know, in this day and age, it's pretty easy to find out the reputation of somebody as a clinic, which kind of goes back to, you can go on social media, you can find out, you can, you know, sometimes Google or find videos of people are teaching. And again, I am so with you. I have probably had some of my most aha moments with less famous people that I was yep. able to really instrument into my own training. But one one point into this is that I feel like there's two ways to look at it. If you have a clinician that's retired and not riding, a lot of times those people are now, because they haven't been on a horse in a while, even though they remember if they've had a long career or whatever, it, you have to get very creative um, in how to give the information in a way rather than getting on and fixing it, right? which not a lot of clinicians yeah. will get on. But but so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. But I think for myself, I, at this juncture in my life, I really like to ride with a clinician that is still currently riding and, and training and teach or, you know, and showing, because I feel like Tigger, how much has showing changed since you and I have been showing and how you uh, do it why? and how, and so somebody who's like very current that way, but still has old school values. Yeah, I agree so, 100%. Let's... One of the best clinics um, I ever went to was a closed clinic. And it was the first time that I was introduced to Conrad Schumacher. And mm. I, they only allowed the grooms or, you know, luckily Gretchen Verbonic retired, but she invited me to come with her. And as much as I like auditing clinics, there's also a great benefit for a lot of riders to a closed clinic. And mm-hmm. it really allows you 100% focus both from the clinician and from the rider. Because mm-hmm. there's no... One of the things about auditing that is a tendency, certainly in dressage, probably in every other horse sport, is the the rail chatter. And, yeah. you know, it's not just it shows, it's also in auditing. Oh, did you see that? She lost her stirrup or she's dropping her yeah. right shoulder or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that horse, and the nice thing about a closed Arms. clinic is that you don't have any of that. So for the rider, it's less stress and not having to impress or that, feeling that you have to impress or that feeling that you're going to fail and be laughed mm-hmm. at or that feeling of being inadequate and all those, you know, it's a jumble of all those feelings when you're riding in front of auditors and in a closed yeah. clinic, all that goes away. And, um, I, I rode several times with Conrad in closed clinics and I, I mean, they were great. And I was really grateful at one um, when he really gave me the business, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, you know, you don't want other people to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Really got, yeah. He got on my, he got on my case and luckily I am of the temperament that I can handle it. Also, I had trained in Europe, so I was kind of used to being yelled at, um, yeah. and not taking it personally. But I was very appreciative that there wasn't an audience watching. Oh, that makes because sense. It, it's a little it can be a little embarrassing. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, and just there and go. Oh, I just spent this much money. Now I'm embarrassed. I mean, and it's. I think sometimes I feel like people can get very because even though I keep saying that I, I like positive reinforcement, I, I really do. It's not. And believe me. I, I can take a whooping, but is but I have to I have to be in a place where I can receive. If someone just starts yelling at me for something that I don't know that I did wrong, then I start to shut down. And yeah. um, so, and I think that it, it's funny that you mentioned that because the clinics that I generally, if I put on clinics for myself or my clients, I always limit the auditors, or I'll have some private sessions just because um, yeah. sometimes you're figuring something. And yeah. as, as silly as it is, this sometimes this, you know, figuring these things out, it's easier to do it when no one else is there because you have yeah. more of a, I, I think it's mind. That's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. It's, it's being able to focus and not be in that fear mode and you're not performing 
you're, you know, trying to get you and your horse better. And I, yeah. I think my final point is really be honest as a rider with both your horse and yourself about where you are. I mean, do you need yeah. to ride with a an Olympian? Eh, maybe not yet. Maybe you're mm-hmm. better off with somebody who has trained FEI and has been very successful bringing young horses and riders mm-hmm. up. But maybe they didn't make an Olympic team, or maybe they, they never got to Grand Prix. But, you know, because getting to Grand Prix with on a horse that you've trained yourself, there's not a, a, a whole boatload of people who have done that. So it's a, it's a pretty yeah. small pool, and they're very special. But you may not need that. You may mm-hmm. need somebody that um, just understands the training scale and has the compassion and ability to communicate without freaking you out. Exactly. But, you know, most of the time when you bring somebody in that's different than you for your clients or even for yourself or however that's going to work, you're already going to be a little nervous anyway. Yeah. I mean, I've done this my whole life. I don't get nervous like I used to. I get excited because I want new information or I want to hear the same thing. (laughs) It's just a little bit of a different way. But I I agree with you wholeheartedly because my final point was going to be is find out what the person's show record is, whether it's from a long time ago or currently, and what the student's show record is. Because as you know, Tigger, um, everybody who over in Europe, they're always like, okay, look at, look at, you know, Isabella Vert. Well, who does she ride with? That's always the, their mindset. Who does who has she been riding with? Because just because somebody is an awesome competitor and a great trainer does not mean that they're a good teacher. Yeah, that's a that's a skill set. And I think that's probably one of the most important points. Is and I think what you're saying is you don't have to ride with an Olympian and know where you are because not all Olympians can teach. No, you know, if you're somebody who's pretty serious about sport and um, you want to move your horse up the levels, it's not a bad idea to do a clinic with a judge. Um, Not that the judge is necessarily a good trainer, but to learn the skills Mm -hmm. of the ring in terms of what they're looking for. It's absolutely the, it's the things of, you know, how much bend you have in a corner. And mm-hmm. it's the, it's it's the why little the, detail. What, I agree. Now, I encourage riders to, you know, get information, get out of your personal sandbox and, and go ride with other people, but do it with not wild abandonment like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and like you said, if you can go and watch somebody teach, I think that's so valuable because I because what people don't think about as a clinician myself, not everybody understands that clinicians and riders don't always mesh. It doesn't mean the clinician wasn't the right, right clinician or whatever, but it, some people just I have I've gotten into situations where I'm like, okay, I have to dig deep because this is going south, and all I was working on was a halt. You know what I mean? So <laughs> how do you, you know? How how do you change that, you know, whole thing? And so sometimes, you know, that's, like I said, it's a whole other skill set that people don't realize, you know, of course you're going into it thinking about the money and how you do it, but you, and, and, and only the last thing I'm going to say is if you audited something and you liked it and wrote in it and didn't particularly like it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it again. Cause sometimes that's it's true. understanding the person teaches that it may take you a little bit and you may be missing out on an awesome opportunity. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, 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 hello. Hey, Hey, we have somebody new for you to meet. Okay. We've actually met once, like, I don't know, almost 20 episodes ago. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's lovely to speak with you again. Please excuse the social skills or lack thereof of my compatriots. Okay. <laughs> so Hetty, this is, this is Amber. Amber, this Hello. is Hetty. Hello. Hi Hetty. Hey girl. How's it going? 
I'm living the dream, if by dream I mean nightmare. Oh. So you prefer the nightmares over the dreams. Your dreams are nightmares. No, my life is a nightmare. I would prefer <laughs> a dream. Oh, okay. That makes a little bit more sense. Well, I have yeah. a question for you, Hedwig. Okay. So I know you're a Pomeranian, and those dogs are typically, how should I say, kind of bougie, a bit superficial from the ones I've seen. They got Bite me. <laughs> well, you know, they, they're in little purses sometimes. Oh, my God, never. No. Those oh. Are not many. No. Mm-mm. Oh, Mm-mm. okay. So those are stuffed dogs. See, that's what I wanted to know. Were you one of those Pomeranians or not? So you're not a stroller girl. <laughs> no. Did you not ever hear what my favorite song is? Your favorite song? Yes. Were you not aware of my favorite song? No, I, I don't think I know it. Mantra, my motto, my theme song. Please sing it. You, it's by the artist known as Pink. Mm. And my favorite line is, Nitty gritty, dirty, little freak. Raise <laughs> your paws. Come in, raise your paws for me. Mm. I don't remember the lyrics <laughs> being that. But lovely song, lovely voice. Yeah, I'm yes. excellent at singing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's true you that are. the original version about the paws was modified for radio play because people uh, felt that paws was alienating. They liked glass better. But the original mm. is Raise Your Paws. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for demonstrating and for explaining that you are not a bougie Pomeranian. You're, you're, I can't even believe that you misunderstood me to this extent. I know. I really just went with the stereotype. I completely stereotyped you, Hedwig. How dare I? Yeah, I mean, I'm sad that's for what... you. <laughs> I'm sad for me, too. Yeah. I feel like I'm in a nightmare now. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you are. You are. It's very yeah. dangerous to insult a Pomeranian, let me tell you. Mm. <laughs> if, you're hard, if you are wrong in all the right ways, all my <laughs> underdogs, we will never be, never be anything but down. <laughs> nitty, nitty, dirty, little freaks. Won't you come on in, come on in, raise your paws. Come on in, come on in, raise <laughs> your paws. For me. Thank you, Hetty. Bravo, Hetty. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Hetty. Bye. Bye. Okay, so we are at the critter portion of the show, and of course I've been on this whole chicken thing. And folks, you can thank me now. We're going to do the Polish chicken. Um, <laughs> they, you got to look this up because they're they're and they are very interesting. Well, here let me tell you, they're they're a European breed of a crested chicken known for their wonderful crest or poof of feathers on the top of their head. They're really honestly almost cartoon-like. Their exact origins are not certain, but basically we know it was from the Netherlands. Not sure why they've gotten the Polish part of this, but they're definitely credited for the breeding of them, and they are pretty darn cool. you got to look these up. They're known primarily for being a show chicken or an ornamental chicken. <clears throat> when you see them, you'll understand why, because they have just this, depending on the, the, the type that you go with, they just have a, just a great little poof. They look like Tina Turner of chickens. They're just adorable. They are very good white egg producers, and the hens, this is kind of a good thing, barely get broody because apparently they're not very good mothers. I guess that they're all into the looks. So what broody means is when a chicken basically wants to sit on chicks, and um, it's a good thing when they don't get broody. So, But apparently they're not great mothers. 
they have a small V-shaped comb that is often hidden because their feathers are so big on the top of their head. They're very easy to introduce to your flock because they can be low in the pecking order, which I'm excited about because I'm getting four of these at the end of the month. They so can tolerate full-time confinement well, which is great. You do have to watch out if you have already a flock of chickens if you decide to get these because they can get easily uh, picked on because they're low on the, the food chain. You know there what the are many do? Different... The other chickens go, <laughs> oh, I'm sure they're like, are they going to break out and song dance? I mean, they're just <laughs> wild. <laughs> So here's the thing that, that that's great. And honestly, if anybody, the listeners, you have to look these up. There's a bunch of different types of varieties and colors, and some of them come bearded and others don't. But there's a buff laced, which is sort of a, you know, a kind of a neat buff color. Um, but there's a black crested, which is black with a white poof on their head. But then there's a black crested white, which means they're white with a black poof. I did not know that. If I'd known that, I was going to be, I would have totally got them. They're so cute. Um, um, one of the things that I found in my quest to find these guys is that for some reason, they, they, I guess because they mature a little bit later, but the younger Polishes are very hard to sex at a glance. Um, often around six, seven weeks, you can sort of start to see that which what's going to be a rooster and what's going to be hen. But this often is leading people that are wanting hens ending up with roosters. In time, it becomes a little bit easier to see. So you either have to go to a hatchery that will sex them when they hatch, or you have to wait a period of time because you don't want to end up with too many roosters. For a rooster, how you can tell when they're a little bit older is that their crest will stand up a little bit more upright, and they're quite messy and, quite frankly, wild-looking. As a, as a whole, generally, they have a very good temperament, and they're quite docile. However, because of how many feathers they can have on the top of their head, they can act, they can't always see well. So they can be startled very easily. Some people actually even trim them, which is kind of cute. They're not a very big bird, even though they're pretty decent egg layers. But the males get to about six pounds, and the females get to about four and a half. They're not a very big chicken, but they're very good producing egg chickens. But like I said, they're mainly known as an ornamental show chicken. And I, Tigger, am quite excited about mine that are coming at the end of the month, and I will let you know how this goes. But, I can't uh, wait. Yeah, so I'm getting a black crusted and two black uh, crusted crusted and two buff laced, and I will. And if you look at them as chicks, they have a little poof on the top of their head. Cutest thing, I'm telling you. It, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna want them. You're gonna get them. I just know it. <laughs> And now we're at Critter Nutrition, and the topic is don't forget the vitamin E. Vitamin E is one of the essential vitamins that horses cannot synthesize or make in their bodies. Unlike the B vitamins, which are produced in concert with the microbiota in the hindgut, vitamin E must be provided through food. Fresh forage is the best food source of vitamin E. What does vitamin E do? Vitamin E plays an important role in health and performance as a super antioxidant. It protects tissues and cells from harmful free radicals. Without antioxidants like vitamin E, free radicals and oxidative stress can cause irreparable damage to cell membranes. Because it's a fat-soluble vitamin, vitamin E can incorporate itself directly into cell membranes and help protect them. Vitamin E is essential for the reproductive, circulatory, immune, muscular, and nervous systems of the body. Does my horse get vitamin E from hay? While hay does provide vitamin E, only small amounts survive the cutting, baling, and drying process. It's estimated that 86% of vitamin E content is lost in the haying process. Horses who are on hay all winter uh, or on dry lots or on restricted access to fresh forage will need to be supplemented with vitamin E. Can my horse get enough vitamin E from a complete feed? The answer to this is possibly. The National Research Council's basic vitamin E requirement is 500 international units per day for a horse not in work. 
Most complete feeds provide 100 to 150 international units of vitamin E per pound. If feeding the label recommended servings per day, for example, three pounds, plus access to fresh pasture six to eight hours per day, your horse will have adequate amounts of vitamin E. For horses in light work, the National Resource Council minimum vitamin E requirement is 800 international units a day. And for horses in heavy work, the minimum vitamin E requirement is 1,000 international units a day. Keep in mind the National Resource Council's requirements have not been updated since 2007. Many vets and nutritionists find these vitamin E requirements to be too low and absolutely inadequate for horses with EPM, metabolic syndrome, tying-up syndrome, equine motor neuron disease, Lyme disease, and PSSM. Fortunately, there are a lot of brand choices when it comes to supplementing with vitamin E. Unfortunately, this can lead to confusion. So let's start with two basic choices, synthetic or naturally sourced. The chemical structures of synthetic vitamin E and vitamin E from a natural source are different. The differences are seen when evaluating serum levels in the body. Naturally sourced vitamin E raises serum levels of vitamin E faster and lasts longer than synthetic vitamin E. Synthetic vitamin E is delineated on the label as DL-alpha tocopherol. Naturally sourced vitamin E is delineated on the label as D-alpha tocopherol. Why is D-alpha tocopherol vitamin E so popular? Vitamin E is made up of two families of compounds known as tocopherols and tocotrienols. Each family is subdivided into four members or types, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. 50 years ago, scientists believed that alpha tocopherol was the most bioavailable of all these components, based in part on the percentage of alpha tocopherol found in the human body. Now, modern science is better understanding the health benefits of the other tocopherols, beta, gamma, and delta, which are naturally available together in certain foods. Gamma tocopherol, for instance, works as an anti-inflammatory and reduces oxidative stress in the brain. Other recent research has shown that supplementing with high levels of alpha tocopherol by itself actually reduces serum levels of the other tocopherols, including gamma. While many supplements provide D-alpha tocopherol, it's one fractionated part of the much, much larger whole vitamin E complex that's essential for optimum health. Supplementing with only the D-alpha tocopherol component is like feeding your horse calcium with no other macro and micro minerals. Real horses and real dogs are healthier, perform better, and recover more quickly on real food. That's why Biostar empowers horse and canine owners with 100% whole food nutrition, supplements, and feeding programs. Biostar products are made at their own certified non-GMO facility in Gordonsville, Virginia, using real fruit ingredients that are raw, freeze-dried, or dehydrated, never cooked, and are free from artificial flavors, colors, soy, corn, wheat, and molasses. The Biostar product line includes a wide range of whole food, horse and dog supplements, treats, and unique artisan poultices that embrace the ancient and traditional uses of clay and plants. Visit BiostarUS.com today and learn about whole foods and canine and equine nutrition so you can make the best decisions about the care and health of your horses and dogs. That's BiostarUS.com. Whole food nutrition the way nature intended. Coffee Clatch, and we thought it'd be fun to uh, guess what breed of dog we think we are and what we think each other is. But we're going to start with Amber. Amber, what breed of dog do you think you are? Okay, so I thought long and hard about this, and I've come to the conclusion that I would consider myself a Scottish Terrier. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, oh, I love so, that. I am not Scottish, so it has nothing to do with that. But I don't know. They're just so... 
they have this stoicness about them yeah. that's just so cute yeah. but they have lots of personality too and i just love the way they shuffle when they walk <laughs> i think it's so, so cute like they have little dresses <laughs> <laughs> Patty, what breed of dog do you think you are? <laughs> I think I think I'm several things, but I'm going to go with this one. I think that I'm a French bulldog <gasps> because yes. I think because why, what do you say, Tigger? I, that was one of the things I first thought of with you. Are you okay? Okay, so this is why I I think this because. They're funny. And they're a little weird, but you don't want to piss them off. Mm. I mean, they're they're comical dogs. Well, because they're bulldogs. I mean, like they're they're the first one to get into a fight. I mean, if like they're going to defend anybody, they can't. Like you know, they're going to ask questions later and bite. They're going to bite first and ask ask questions later. I like it. I love French bulldogs. They're so cute. Right. Well, I've got two, and they're about they're about to get a little scuffy now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tigger, what about uh, you? I think I'm a terrier. You know, uh, either a Jack or... I, I'd like to think I'm cute like a Karen or a Norwich. <laughs> but I have that feisty, you know, I don't let go of something. Um, I'm pretty determined. And I'm kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Accurate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely now, I will tell you what okay, so I think you are, Patty. To me, you're a cross between a Doberman Pinscher and a Siberian Husky. <laughs> really? Well, actually, yeah. that doesn't surprise me. And, and share with me why. So I, I, when I think of you physically, I think of you like a Doberman. Very, you know, elegant and very protective of family, very loyal and then the Siberian Husky is like the workhorse, but funny, crazy, very mouthy, talky, vocal. So that seems so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so Adobe Siberian Husky cross. Okay. Okay. I would love to see like one that. of those. I hope they exist somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine a, Dober- a Doberman with a coat? Yeah. Oh, gosh. We could call it a husky dobe. A doba husk. A <laughs> doba husk. A new designer breed. A doba husk. Okay, Tigger, I have to, I've got to tell you what I have for you. And, but I'm going to, I, so when I think of you, I think saucy, smart, intelligent, energetic, and funny. And that really covers a lot of breeds. But the first thing, but you're, you're just a fashionista. Okay, you're fashionista. You always get so the first one I thought of and it, it was Papillon because they are Oh my they're god. Smart. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> no. Now again, I could have gone with a Karen or I could have gone with a Norwich. And I because you're you're definitely more earthy than a Papillon. But the first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, that dog <laughs> looks good. Always looks good. You always look good. And they're oh, funny dogs. Thanks. Yeah. So, but I also had Aff and Venture <laughs> because they're just funny. Deep in my heart, I feel like, although I have a lot of terrier traits, I feel like I'm most like an Aussie. Okay, I wasn't going to do it. That was literally the first thing I thought of. Me too. I wasn't because I thought say it, but... that's too boring. <laughs> Well, but it's also, it's a little too predictable. So Amber, you need to know that both Tigger and I, well, Tigger, Tigger is, um, is the Aussie capital of, um, Virginia yeah. and I have, yeah. oh. myself. and, um, and honestly, that's the first dog I thought of when describing you something funny, fashionable, athletic, intelligent, all of those things. But, um, I needed to go. So I, yeah. I'm with you on that one. Okay, well, the first thing I thought of with you is a Frenchie, but then I didn't want to say that because you already have Frenchies and I wanted to expand the, yeah. So, Doba Husk. That's it. Doba Husk. Doba okay. Husk, I'm, I'm, and you're, yeah, that's right. And I'm a 
a happy Athen, an Athen pappy. <laughs> happy Athen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, did you well, we'd like to hear what Amber? breed of dogs our, our uh, listeners think they are. <laughs> so let us know. Uh, we're on Facebook, Healthy Critters Radio. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks to our sponsor, Biostar US. You can find them online at biostarus.com. Get the Horse Radio Network phone app on iOS or Android by searching for Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It's free and easy to use. For details about today's show, go to HealthyCrittersRadio.com, where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. As always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Healthy Critters Radio. Be sure to visit all the great shows on Horse Radio Network at HorseRadioNetwork.com. Love your dog. Hug your horse. Feed your chickens. Clean your litter box. Dance with your goat. Slither with your snakes. Howl at the moon. Hang with your hamster. Party with your parrot. Waddle with your walrus. Outwit your otter. Cuddle your cows. Rap with your raptor. Go chipping with your chipmunks. Forgive your fox. While hedging your hog. We also recommend that you rack with your raccoon. Gyrate with your giraffe. Meditate with a meerkat. Uber with your orangutan. Facebook with your flamingo. Ponder with your panda. Walk with your wookie. Yawn with your yak. Twitter with your toucan. Go raining with your reindeer. Dropbox your dragon. (laughs) 